a reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable part for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground various wild animals and various birds of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called each of them would be his name. The man gave, gave names to all the cattle, all the birds of the air, and all wild animals. But none proved to be a suitable partner for the man. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. The Lord God then built up into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. When he brought her to the man, the man said, This one, at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one flesh. The word of the Lord.
do concentrate, 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 and those who are being consecrated all have one origin. Therefore, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. The word of the Lord. Three laws 
may be given to help judge the difference between true and false enthusiasm. First, decisions and resolutions taken during an enthusiastic moment mean little unless they are tested by time and by waiting. At the beginning of the public life of our blessed Lord, when many wished to follow him, he refused to accept them because he knew what was in man. The request to sit at his right and at his left by James and John was not immediately granted. It was tested by the ability to bear sacrifice and to drink the cup of his passion and crucifixion. After multiply, multiplying the bread, the multitude wanted to make him a king. Yet by the next day, many left our blessed Lord and returned to their former way of life. Economic kingships last only while the bread is plentiful and the circus is in town. It's always a good policy never to choose the most enthusiastic person as a leader. Wait to see how much wood they have to feed the fire. Second, almost all moments of high physical stimulation are followed by a period of depression. As I said in my homily two weeks ago, the excesses of lust deflate and it creates its own emptiness. The buzz from drinking is followed by a hangover. The dream stage of opium is followed by addiction. The body cannot sustain continued pleasure. As a child, I hated to be tickled by my older brother because my older brother did not know when to stop tickling. The tickling stopped when I took a swing. Third, in all human love, it must be realized that every man promises a woman and every woman promises a man that which only God alone can ultimately give, namely, to love another person as God loves them, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. That is how God loves us, unconditionally, and that's why matrimony is a sacrament in the church as these vows can only be fulfilled with the help of sacramental grace. One of the reasons why marriages are shipwrecked is because as the young couple leaves the altar, if they come to the altar at all, they fail to realize that human feelings tire and that the enthusiasm of the honeymoon is not the same as the more solid happiness of enduring love over the years. In the first moments of human love, one does not see the hidden imperfections and deformities which later on appear. And sometimes it's not so much the great hurts which cause enthusiasm to cool, but rather the steady diet of mediocrities, the repeated insincerities, the getting used to one another's company, the everyday dust of human existence. There comes a time when the husband seems less handsome and the wife less beautiful just because of the habit of seeing each other. So when enthusiasm cools, then one hears, you're not the one I married. Whether in marriage or in the priesthood, life is not a snare because the bubbles cease in the champagne glass. True happiness comes to man unless he places his heart in a false infinite. One who sees that marital love or love for his priesthood is nothing but divine love on a pilgrimage, we will use marriage or priesthood as a kind of Jacob's ladder to climb back again through the virtues to the source of all love who is God. Such spiritual fires never cool, but grow in the coals lighted at the furnace of heaven that touch the lips of the prophets and define the presence of the Holy Spirit, that first Pentecost. I read a daily devotional. It's entitled, Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. I love this book. And this book is referenced in the bulletin this weekend if you want to get a copy. So here's the entry for August 27, which speaks to mediocrities, the daily dust of human existence, in marriage or priesthood or in life in general. Jesus is speaking. Spend time with me, 
for the pure pleasure of being in my company. I can brighten up the dullest of gray days. I can add sparkle to the routine of daily life. You have to repeat so many tasks day by day. And this can dull your thinking until your mind slips into neutral. A mind that is unfocused is vulnerable to the world, the flesh, and the devil, all of which exert a downward pull on your thoughts. As your thinking processes deteriorate, you become increasingly confused and directionless. The best remedy is to refocus your mind and your heart on me, your constant companion. So let's take a test. On a scale of 0 to 10, what value do you give to ordination in order for a man to live and act like a priest? In other words, can a man, can a seminarian, studying for the priesthood, confect the Eucharist, absolve sin, anoint the sick, prior to his ordination? Of course not. Because everyone gives ordination the value of 10. He needs to be ordained in order to live and act in holy orders, hence the name of the sacrament, to act and live like a priest. On a scale of 0 to 10, what value do you give to marriage in order to live and act like you're married? Can a couple live and act like they are married prior to the wedding? Many couples do. Couples who live and act like they are married without being married obviously give marriage the value of zero as their actions say loud and clear that you don't need to be married in order to live and act like you are married. So how many marriages of those cohabitating are shipwrecked because out of the gate they give marriage the value of zero since you don't need to be married in order to live and act like you're married. The young couple living together approach the altar thinking that they have lived together. They have lived together, but before the enthusiasm has cooled. And they will shipwreck because they do not value marriage in the first place. Marriage gets a value of zero. Many of the false enthusiasms in the world today come from those who find spurious happiness in the here and now like cohabitation. Happiness in the here and now. But what about the quiet whisper of the long haul? What about the more solid happiness of enduring human love over the years? Well, the writer of First Kings greases the skids. Then the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Behold, the Lord is about to pass by. And a great and mighty wind tore into the mountain and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a still, small voice. The truest enthusiasms are never loud. Our blessed Lord's voice was never heard screaming in the streets. To be enthusiastic in one's vocation, whether priesthood or marriage, is to live out the meaning of the word enthusiastic, which comes from two Greek words, en, meaning full, and theos, meaning God. To be enthusiastic in marriage or in priesthood means to be filled with God.